Good morning and welcome to Weekends with Whitney. We start this morning's show in Point Capi Parish, where we will visit with the author Ernest Gaines. So many of his books took place right in this area, in this cemetery, in those sugarcane fields. We'll learn more about the author and his works coming up. Also on this morning show, Mary Ann from Gilligan's Island. I sit down with the 76-year-old star and find out her secrets to staying young in spirit and body. Plus, the surprising power and benefits of simply wandering with Dr. Nick. And a quick, cool summertime dish, seared ahi tuna. Chef Harrison Decker at the Little Village shows us how. But we begin this morning with the life of one of Louisiana's great writers, Ernest Gaines. He was born right here on this plantation, the son of a sharecropper. And this was a setting for many of his books. Celebrated as one of Louisiana's greatest writers, Ernest Gaines paints a picture of rural African-American life in South Louisiana with words that pierce your soul. You're not a bum, she says, you're a man. Five generations of his family lived on this plantation in Oscar, Louisiana. First as slaves, then as sharecroppers. They were poor and lived in old slave quarters on this land. As a boy, he worked these fields sometimes 16 hours a day. In the segregated South, African-American children were not allowed to go to school. So when harvest season was over, the sharecroppers pulled the little money they had paid for a teacher to come in and use the church they built as a schoolhouse. Ernest was the first in his family to read and write. I suppose I must have tried preparing to be a writer from, from the beginning uh, from my early childhood because I used to write letters for the old people and many of these old people had never gone to school or couldn't read or write, you know. The oldest of 12 children, he was raised by his crippled Aunt Augustine. His mother and stepfather moved to California during World War II because the only jobs for them in rural Louisiana were in the fields. To rise above poverty, moving was their only option. They sent money to Aunt Augustine, whom they called Aunt Annie, to support the children. She did everything for us. She crawled over that floor all her life. Aunt Annie was his everything. She's been the greatest influence on my life as man as well as writer. She was the inspiration for Miss Jane Pittman and other strong female characters in his books. Such love and devotion when she could have sat around and had people feel sorry for her all day. No, she didn't feel sorry for herself, so we couldn't feel, we didn't look at Haiti as being crippled. We just, uh, you know, this is a lady, mm. you know, and uh, we knew we had to do certain things for her, but, um, we never did feel sorry for any of Annie rarely left home. It gave Ernest a front row seat to rich stories and conversations. People used to always come to our house, always talking to people, talking. And that's where I learned a lot about um, the different voices for, uh, multiple voices for books, you know, to, because the people used to gather at my uh, aunt house because she couldn't go anywhere else. Mm. Black children were not allowed to go to high school. They also couldn't go to the public library. So at 15, Ernest moved to California to be with his parents. So I had to go, I had to go to, to California to be a writer. I had to go, they, they weren't going to teach me anything here. I had to go. There he walked into a library for the first time. This world of books enraptured and enveloped him. From uh, the time I was about 16, 16, 17 years old, I knew the only thing in the world I wanted to do was to be a writer. Now, had I not become a writer, I, uh, I, I would probably not be alive today. He lived to write, but first he read. I read everything, but I was very, uh, especially impressed by the, um, uh, the 19th century Russian writers. Uh, the, uh, Chekhov and Tegenev, uh, uh, Tolstoy, 
Then I read uh, uh, the French writers, uh, other writers. I learned from. I learned from everybody. I've read. I've read from. Learned from Shakespeare. I've learned from Faulkner. I've learned from Tolstoy. I've learned from Hemingway. I've learned from everyone. I've read. I learned from the Bible. At 17, he wrote his first novel. I was the only person who thought it was a novel. I mean, it wasn't a novel, you know. I had uh, written on both sides of the paper. Mm -hmm. I had uh, cut the paper in a, like a uh, uh, half, like a book size. I done all this. Everything's wrong. Everything wrong that you can do, that you can do. And uh, I just wrapped it up in some uh, uh, wrapping paper and with strings and tied and sent it out. And uh, of course they sent it back and I, and I burned it. <laughs> Yet he still had a burning desire to write. So he enrolled at San Francisco State University. He earned his degree in literature there. Then he won a writing fellowship at the prestigious Stanford University. He was still only writing short stories, wary of failing at another novel. Ten years later, uh, after that, I started writing short stories, trying to write short stories. Ten years later, I was at, uh, at Stanford, and uh, uh, someone gave a lecture uh, in, in explaining to us that uh, in the lecture that young writers had to produce a novel before they could really sell, the, sell their short stories. Uh, or try to sell a, a volume of short stories you'd have a novel for us. And so I just stopped writing that day. I quit writing my short stories. And uh, the only novel I could think of was the thing I'd burned about uh, 10 years before. And uh, I just stopped writing and started going back on that. And I, I won an award for it uh, in San Francisco. The award money and his part-time jobs supported his emerging writing career. Uh, I, worked for, I worked for a printing press. I worked um, in a library. But he struggled to finish writing his first novel that would one day become Catherine Carmier. Stuck in writer's block, he decided there was only one thing to do. Ernest says there were two pivotal days in his life as a writer that probably helped create his success. The first was when he left Louisiana. The second, when he came home. I had to go there to be the writer, but I had to come back to be the writer. Mm -hmm. I had to go there to learn to be educated, you know. But I had to come back to the uh, source in order to, to write, because that's the only source I knew. He spent the next six months in Louisiana, not writing, but bathing in its essence. In Orleans, well, I traveled over the place. I uh, went to the churches and went to the Catholic church, and I knew different girls, and I, uh, I went to different little bars with my uncle. I went to some of the tough bars where guys would fight, you know, cut up each other, and and I I wanted it. I wanted it to uh, to experience that. When he went back to California, the rest of the novel flowed like the mighty Mississippi. That pattern would continue. And I had to do that with all my books. I had to go. I'd come back, write the books. I'd get the all material here, but I'd go back to San Francisco to write the books. It's ironic and intriguing. He'd have to go home to a place still stagnated by repressive Jim Crow laws to free his soul to write. I didn't want to come back to the South. I didn't want to come back here at all. But I couldn't get all the, the everything I needed in the, in the, in the, to, put, to put in that book, to make that book what it is today. Today, Catherine Carmier is 51 years old. Published in 1964, Ernest read it again just recently. I read that book uh, um, less than a year ago, and I thought it was quite good at one time. <laughs> also good these days, oh, no. his and his wife's tireless efforts to preserve this church. Mm. It's nearly 100 years old, and it's the very um, church often written about in his books, where as a young boy he worshipped and went to school. And buried here in this cemetery, 
are family members and neighbors who have lived and died since the days of slavery. Next Sunday on Weekends with Whitney, we'll explore both of these treasures. Still to come, from the page to the stage, I sit down with Mary Ann from Gilligan's Island. How at 76 years old, the pop icon is going as strong as ever. Plus, the power of wandering with Dr. Nick. And we head into the kitchen at the Little Village for a perfect summertime tuna dish as Weekends with Whitney continues. This segment brought to you by our friends at Wayne Stabler Companies. Welcome back to Weekends with Whitney. It's the most popular and longest three-hour tour in the world, Gilligan's Island. Fifty years later, it's still on TV. But only two of the seven castaways are still alive, Ginger and Mary Ann. Well, I was lucky enough recently to sit down with Don Wells, who played Mary Ann. We talked about the show, the job she wished she'd had, and her secret to staying young. It's hard to believe that Marianne, many of us grew up with, is now 76 years old. It's surprising to her, too. You know, I don't realize how old I am when you see the generations that you touch. Gilligan's Island aired only three seasons on CBS from 1964 to 1967. It had solid ratings, but right before its fourth season, it was abruptly canceled in favor of Gunsmoke. Regardless, its popularity exploded in syndication. In the 1970s and 1980s, it aired in the afternoons. Kids just getting home from school Let me loved it. Entertain you. 40 years later, we can still remember the words. Well, most of them. It's like there once was a man named it right now, I have to think about it. Gilligan's Isle, oh, Gilligan's Isle, right? Tale of a tiny ship. Let's sit right back in you here, a tale. A tale of a fateful trip. That started? That started from this tropic port. Aboard the tiny ship. The mate was a mighty sailor man. The skipper made a shore. Five passengers that sailed that day. A three-hour tour. Three-hour tour. If not for the courage of the field, let's screw the middle would be lost. The middle would be lost. Skipper to uh, get the millionaire and his wife, a movie star. The professor <laughs> and Mary Ann. Here on Gilligan's Isle. Here on Gilligan's Isle. I, I think it was just the first reality TV show. I mean, when you think about it, it was a bunch of people on an island for years and years. It was like Survivor. They were ahead of their time. Hey, oh, you're wonderful. You're wonderful. You're the wonderful. show turned Dawn Wells into an international pop culture icon. It's syndicated in 30 languages all over the world. At 76 years young, she still has the same beautiful smile and charisma. Her secret, she says, is attitude and anticipation. Something to, something to look forward to, positive attitude. And I'm also, I don't have children, so I'm not a grandmother. You know, somebody calling you grandma and your daughter's married to somebody you don't like. I mean, there's worries. I took care of my mom, took care of my ex-husband, and, and I look forward till tomorrow. I think a lot of it's mental. In the minds of most, she'll always be Mary Ann. 
But after leaving the show, she immersed herself into theater, appearing in more than 100 productions. I just finished um, Love Lost and What I Wore, and I'm rehearsing for Driving Miss Daisy. It's your age bracket. And I did all the Neil Simons and that kind of stuff, but now they cast me in something with some depth. So it's, it's a chance to really do some acting and rather than a sitcom, and I don't mean there's anything wrong with that, but to kind of all, what you're trained for, almost. In college, she trained and majored in theater, but also in chemistry. While she didn't use her chemistry background to earn a living, with you, my temperature her chemistry certainly ignited a worldwide debate. Ginger or Mary Ann? It inspired commercials. Okay, Ginger or Mary Ann? T-shirts and plenty of conversation. Mary Ann. Mary Ann. Say Ginger. Well, how about Mrs. Howell? She had the money. <laughs> ginger. Mary Ann. Mary Ann. I'm gonna go with Mary Ann. Ginger. Well, I've got to go with Mary Ann. All of the above. <laughs> Mary Ann is the perennial favorite, winning in most polls nearly two to one. It mirrors their fan mail during the show too. Dawn got nearly 5,000 letters weekly, twice as much as Tina Louise, who played Ginger. While the sultry redhead is certainly the most glamorous of the two stars, it might surprise you to know that Dawn Wells was a beauty queen in her own right. She was Miss Nevada and competed in the Miss America pageant in 1960. Beauty icon Raquel Welch auditioned for the part of Mary Ann, but Dawn Wells won it. Cast in the role of a simple farm girl from Kansas, Dawn wasn't outfitted in sexy ball gowns, but her signature outfit was a TV first. It was the first time short shorts were ever worn on TV, but you won't see her belly button. The FCC prohibited showing your belly button. 50 years later, Dawn is showing the world there's a lot of living to do after being on a hit TV show. No, I mean, I've traveled a lot. I've been all over the world. I did the gorilla climb. I went around the world on the Concord. Um, I'd like to learn another language. I don't know. I mean, I'm always looking forward to tomorrow. I love to cook. I've got a couple of projects. Leonard and I have a couple of projects. We'll see how it goes. But there's one job she'd still like to do. I like your job. I'd like to be a newscaster. I'd like to uh, do a radio show. I'm a news junkie. Never one to cast away a dream, it might just happen for her yet. If you'd like to gorge on some Gilligan's Island reruns, well, they appear every weekday, 5 p.m. our time on MeTV. And still ahead on Weekends with Whitney. The power of wandering, what it does for your mind and soul with Dr. Nick. And the perfect summer dish, seared ahi tuna with wasabi aioli. Chef Harrison Decker at the Little Village shares his secrets. Hi, I'm Robert Meyer, inviting you to spend some of your summer in beautiful new roads. Hit the water of False River for fishing, swimming, boating, and more. Feast on the finest food anywhere at our award-winning restaurants. Get in some retail therapy strolling our unique stores and take in some of our wonderful culture. Spend the day or spend the week. Whatever you do, spend some time in new roads. Give the gift of fine dining. Wayne Stabler Companies is offering one card for four. La Creole, The Little Village, Stab Steak and Seafood. Four sizzling restaurants, one card. Welcome back to Weekends with Whitney. Well, it is July and Time to take some vacation and maybe just wonder. We're joined this morning with Dr. Nick. Good to see you. And, and so and so antithetical to our society. I mean, I sit oh. in therapy day after day telling people or asking people, what are your goals? You know, what's your long-term plan? How do you how do you want to change your life? And then this morning we're sitting here talking about the power of wandering. You know, mm -hmm. and I, I'm remembering the song uh, I wander as I wander out under the sky. One of my favorite hymns. Why poor baby Jesus was born for to die. Well, it's not so much about Jesus, but when you look at the definition of wandering, he was an itinerant preacher. And if you look up wandering, you'll see itinerant falls right under it. Oh. Roaming. Roaming. Not having necessarily 
a destination, just wandering. I haven't let my mind wander in the longest time. I didn't have even thought of it. Wow, just so you just it said wander. it. Just I, letting it like just I go this, where this it and this to do and this. I just, I'm just, I just go back to Jesus, an itinerant preacher. Mm. He had no home. Right. We are so, we are so into being rooted that we forget sometimes being out of the, out of it might be helpful. Yes, but now we have a mutual friend who is a wanderer. I'm not here to say that one should wander for their entire life, <laughs> uh, unless, unless they've got a gypsy mentality, if you will, and they're not mooching off of the world. Ah, uh, sure, sure, they're able to make their way. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I do think that there are people that way. You know, I, I have a dream of being a beach bum and, and being a bartender oh. one day on a beach when I get old. I, I, no, 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 nobody's going to like me because I'm going to be old. But what fun? What and do you, you mean you hear, nobody's going to like hear, you because you're going to be old? What well, do you mean by that? Well, I mean I'm not going to be this young stud on the beach, but I'm going to have. But it would be fun. But you hear how my mind's wandering, mm -hmm. I'm just wandering, and people might say, "That's so ridiculous." And I'm like, "I'm just wandering. Right. I'm well, just having fun." And you might do it one day. You know. You never know. Sounds like fun to me. You ready? I'll be the I'll be the cocktail waitress. <laughs> See you at the beach. <laughs> Much more we can do with we'll you. We'll let you know what beach we're at. <laughs> right after this. It is always tuna time because it's probably my favorite fish ever. And I'm picky though about where I'll eat it. <laughs> Harrison Decker, executive chef here at Little Village Airline, is going to show us how they do it. Oh, I'm so tickled you're doing this. Oh, yeah, I know it's one of your favorites. Um, we are doing our yellowfin tuna steak, and we, the way we do it on our menu, we have the tuna appetizer. It is crusted in black and white sesame seeds. So we just take the tuna steak. Now, are those toasted first, the sesame seeds? They are toasted, yes. Roll it around in there. They stick pretty pretty well. Uh, we have our skillet over here with the oil getting hot. Uh-huh. You want to let that get real hot, because we're not trying to cook it. We just want a, a nice sear on both sides of it. Now, people may ask, do I have to like sushi to enjoy it this way? Oh, no, definitely not. That's here. It's not going to take very long, because oh. the skillet's already hot. Okay. Um, with the tuna. I love it. It gets a little sauteed spinach, so we start out with some red onions. Yeah, the sesame seeds pop. <laughs> it's like popcorn. Kind of like, like popcorn, yeah. <laughs> it's cute. Add a little minced garlic. So that's about all on the tuna. Oh, wow. Take him out. It was even faster than I thought. Real quick. Now that the onions and garlic have softened up a little bit, you add Baby spinach. There. All right, let that saute down. And then we will take it over here to plate it up. Wow. Well, it looks perfect. Yes, lightly seared is the only way to eat it, in my opinion. So, we're going to start with our sweet soy reduction. This is Soy and honey, just a little bit of tomato paste, and we reduce it down to thicken it up. Tomato it's paste? really good. Wouldn't have thought of that. Just draw a little design on the plate. Now we take our sauteed spinach, squeeze some of that excess water out okay. of it. Okay, we're gonna slice our tuna. Is it important which way I do that with the tuna? Um, you wanna do it across across the muscles. See the muscles are going that way, so across the shorter that those muscles are, then the easier it is to eat, the more tender it'll be. Oh, well, great. Now, if I were having a party, Harrison, and I mm -hmm. were going to do this, I guess, could I put it in the refrigerator and serve it cold as well? You or? can, yes. Yeah, so you can sear it and then set it in the refrigerator and serve it cold. Okay. And it'll hold up just fine. 
Okay, so then we take our sliced tuna, and fan it out around the spinach. Just like that. Oh, nice. And then here we have the wasabi aioli. It's wasabi and a little sour cream and some uh, rice wine vinegar. Huh, I would have thought maybe a little mayo, but. Yeah, well, you can. It shows I don't know what yeah. I'm talking about. <laughs> no, no, actually, that's what aioli is, but. Okay. You're right. Perfection. Appetizer meal, nice party appetizers. Oh, yeah, definitely. Or a great dinner. I've ordered it for my um, entree before, too. We do sell it in entree size, also. Great. You'll just love it. Much more Weekends with Whitney right after this. Give the gift of fine dining. Wayne Stabler Companies is offering one card for four. La Creole, The Little Village, Stab Steak and Seafood. Four sizzling restaurants, one card. Atlas Foundation Repair. Fixing your foundation problems for more than 30 years while preserving and protecting your trees. Thanks for spending part of your weekend here with us on Weekends with Whitney. Be sure to tune in next Sunday because more pop culture icons will join us. I sit down with I Dream of Jeannie's Barbara Eden and Major Healy, where life has taken both of them since the hit show and what keeps them going strong. Plus, meet a nine-year-old boy changing the world with change. How he's changing the lives of newborns and their moms. That's next week on Weekends with Whitney, right here, 8 a.m. Sunday morning on WBRZ. Until then, you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But as we leave you this morning, remember, all who wander are not lost. So this morning, let's wander a bit through cool, clean, crisp, incredible waterfalls. Have a great week ahead.